wins if it survives. In We're the only people <laughs> to ever start on time, y'all witness in history. Uh, so, Tom Cotton. <laughs> it's now plain what we suspected all along. Joe Biden's de facto position is for a Hamas victory over Israel. Israel's goal is simple. Rescue the hostages, including American hostages, and destroy Hamas to get justice for the worst atrocity against Jews since World War II and to prevent the next atrocity. Hamas's goal is also simple. Survive. Hamas's leaders and its last four battalions are holed up in Rafah, so Israel has to defeat Hamas in Rafah to win. Hamas wins if it survives in Rafah, and Joe Biden has threatened to withhold weapons from Israel for fighting in Rafah. Therefore, Joe Biden object objectively favors a Hamas victory over Israel. It's just that simple. And the president is only emboldening Hamas. Why would Hamas release hostages when Joe Biden will give Hamas exactly what it wants, survival without releasing hostages? He's also emboldening Iran. Here's what Joe Biden has done since October 7th. Sanctions for Israelis and an arms embargo on Israel. Sanctions relief and the end of an arms embargo on Iran. Now some people say Joe Biden is doing this for his reelection. Which would be bad enough. It would also, I have to add, be grounds for impeachment under the Democrats' Trump Ukraine standard, withholding foreign aid to help one's reelection. Only with Joe Biden, it's true. But I'm afraid it's also worse than that. Joe Biden and Israel hating Democrats are using electoral concerns as a pretext to do what they've always wanted to do, to cut Israel loose. Remember, a lot of Barack Obama's aides, who are now Joe Biden's aides, disputed that Hamas was even a real terrorist group to begin with. For that matter, remember that Joe Biden himself threatened Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin more than 40 years ago with cutting off aid to Israel. Begin humiliated Biden warning him not to threaten Israel, and saying, I am not a Jew with trembling knees. Israel is fighting a just and necessary war. Their knees are not trembling. As Prime Minister Netanyahu just said, they'll fight alone if they have to. But let me assure all the Israelis watching, you won't have to fight alone. You don't have a problem with America. You have a problem with Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer and the Democratic Party. And the American people are going to solve that problem for you in six months. Senator Thund and Collins. All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay, for uh, your leadership on this and uh, all issues that pertain not only to uh, America's national security interests but to that of our allies. 72% uh, of Americans uh, support the idea that Israel needs to take the actions necessary to protect itself and to end the, the rule and reign of Hamas, a terrorist organization operating not only there but in that entire region of the world. Um, that is a much larger percentage of the American people, obviously, than support uh, what Joe Biden is doing. And as has been pointed out, um, this is an opportunity for America to stand shoulder to shoulder with our closest ally and to convey to the uh, people of that country that the United States is a reliable ally and that we can be counted on. The problem with what's happening with the Biden administration today is not only does it uh, force people to question our re reliability as an ally, it puts Israel's national security interests at risk. Uh, this is insane what is being suggested by this administration after the Congress in huge bipartisan fashion supported over $14 billion to go to aid Israel, this administration would decide unilaterally, without any input from Congress or anybody else, that because they don't like the way that Israel is defending itself against this threat, that somehow they're going to start cutting off the very assistance that the United States Congress said 
uh, that we, we want sent to Israel, to our ally, to make sure that they're able to defend themselves and to root out this, uh, this terrorist organization operating on their border. Um, the American people support Israel overwhelmingly, as has already been pointed out. And they also believe that Israel needs to do uh, what is necessary. And if that includes going into Rafah uh, to root out the Hamas threat, then uh, that is necessary for their very survival. This is an existential threat for the people of Israel. The United States need to have their back. We'd have their back. The American people have their back. The Republicans here in the United States Senate have their back. And we will do everything we possibly can to make sure that Joe Biden, notwithstanding his statements of the last few days here, uh, does what the American people and the United States Congress have said we need to be doing to support our strongest ally in the world. Thank you. Well, first, Lindsay, thank you so much for your leadership. Let's review a little bit of recent history. As Senator Thune has just outlined, it was the administration that put together a supplemental funding request to provide weapon systems, munitions, equipment, and other means of assistance to Israel. Congress repeatedly, by overwhelming bipartisan margins, supported that funding, supported assisting our closest ally in the Middle East, Israel. And what did the administration to do? Without any consultation, over the weekend, the administration decides to halt the delivery of essential weapons to Israel. They did not inform the Appropriations Committee. They did not inform the Foreign Relations Committee. They did not inform the Armed Services Committee. It was a unilateral decision. Yesterday, during the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee hearing, many of us questioned Secretary Austin about the decision made secretly over the weekend without consultation with Congress. He said that it was not a final decision. If you pause, if you halt the delivery of weapon systems that Israel needs to defend itself and to win the war against a terrorist group that is dedicated to its destruction, that is a decision. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rich. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I put out a press release on this a little earlier today, which has a lot more detail than what I'm going to say, and it's going to be brief. Uh, look, the nonpartisan uh, weapon sales process has kept uh, domestic uh, political squabbles out of this for a long, long time. Uh, it's been in place for uh, about uh, a half a century, and it has worked really, really well. The administration has stepped outside that uh, uh, those boundaries uh, now with what they're doing here without any notifications to us. Uh, look, we have a situation here where the administrate the Congress passed funding, the administration allowed these weapon sales. Uh, myself and the other three members of Congress who uh, closely look at these uh, sales and take that obligation seriously all signed off on it. And now in the heat of battle, uh, this administration is saying, we're going to pull this back. Uh, th this is unprecedented. It's going to be watched by our enemies. It's going to be watched uh, by our allies, and it is not helpful to the national security of the United States. More importantly, what the administration claims to be trying to do uh, is to reduce the collateral damages uh, when uh, Israel uh, goes into Rafah. And they are going into Rafah. They've said they're going in with or without uh, anybody else's help. Uh, what is the system that they've held up? It's the kits that make the bombs smart bombs and precision bombs instead of uh, general bombs. They're doing exactly the opposite of what uh, they say they're trying to do. This is simply a nod to their far left flank. It's trying to have a foot on each side of the fence, which it can do. Within two hours of uh, the president's announcement last night, Hamas said they were withdrawing uh, from negotiations on hostages uh, and on a ceasefire. 
What the president has done is handed a great victory to Mahas here. It's going to invigorate the fighting uh, that they're doing in uh, Gaza, and it's going to stop the negotiations that have been ongoing. This was a horrible mistake. Thank you. Um, well, what have I learned? It took Hamas two hours to withdraw. It means they have bad Internet. Because I think they would have withdrawn the moment they heard. Uh, we have several other speakers, but I just want to emphasize one thing. This is all about President Biden and Lloyd Austin trying to take over the war from Israel. I got one message for Israel. Don't let them do it. Joni. Yes, thanks everybody for coming out today and Lindsay, thank you for your leadership on this. And I just returned from Israel um, on Tuesday morning. Senator Ted Budd and I had traveled through the region, through the Middle East, and over and over we heard from regional leadership about how important it is for America to step up their leadership. There's a void of leadership in the White House today. And if anything, there's, there's no leadership but in place of that appeasement. And we see Joe Biden doing that. So what we saw and what we heard while we were traveling through the Middle East is that our service members, our service members are under attack. Okay, they're under attack uh, from Iran from Iranian proxies throughout the Middle East, and our citizens are being held captive by Hamas. We cannot forget that there were over 40 Americans killed on October 7th in the attack perpetrated by Hamas when they went into Israel. We have eight Americans that are being held by Hamas three of whom we know are deceased. Five, God willing, are still alive. The last thing that we need is a president who waffles on his support to Israel. So much for that ironclad support, his words, not mine, Joe Biden's ironclad support of Israel. Folks, he's lying to Israel, and he's lying to all of you. It is not ironclad. He is withholding weapons that are needed by our closest friend and ally in the Middle East, Israel. We already have these mouthpieces for Hamas here at home. We've seen them all on these liberal campuses out there supporting and saying they are Hamas. Our own students at liberal elite colleges we don't need the president stepping into that arena as well. The president is a tool, folks. He is a tool. Okay, in this case, he's a propaganda tool. Um, but Hamas is using him, and he is allowing it, and he is turning his back on Israel. So our message today should be, to remember, Mr. President, Hamas created the humanitarian disaster in Gaza. Hamas knew exactly what would happen when they attacked on October 7th. They knew that Israel would respond and that they would strive for victory and the destruction of Hamas. They knew that. This is not Israel's fault. This is Hamas's fault. This is Sinwar's fault. This is Iran's fault. It is not Israel's fault. So we don't need Joe Biden being a mouthpiece for Hamas. We certainly don't need it in our White House. We need new leadership. Senator Cruz and Marshall and we just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the national security policy of Joe Biden and the Democrats is precisely backwards. For three and a half years, Joe Biden and the Democrats have undermined and weakened our friends and allies, and they have sent billions of dollars to our enemies. It is exactly opposite what you would be doing if you were actually focused on U.S. national security interests. Let's look at our enemies. Tragically, 
Joe Biden has been the greatest friend the Ayatollah Khamenei has ever had on planet Earth. Tragically, Joe Biden has been the greatest friend to Hamas and Hezbollah that there is on planet Earth. Now, those sound like extraordinary statements. What are the facts? Under the Biden presidency, this administration has flowed more than $100 billion into Iran. $6 billion in ransom for five Americans, a policy which many of us said at the time would only lead to more Americans being taken hostage, and we saw tragically on October 7th that proved exactly right. $10 billion in funds in Iraq that the Biden administration wanted to flow to the Ayatollah, and then over $80 billion in oil. When Joe Biden came into office, the Trump administration, with the active support of all of us, had vigorously imposed oil sanctions and had cut Iran's oil exports from one million barrels a day down to about 300,000. The Iranian economy was in shambles. The Ayatollah was on his knees. Joe Biden came in like the cavalry coming to the rescue and immediately stopped enforcing oil sanctions. And what happened? Iran's oil sales went from 300,000 barrels a day to now more than 2 million barrels a day. Every one of those barrels is a gift from Joe Biden and the Democrats. That is over $80 billion. Mind you, this is from the same administration that does everything they can to kill oil and gas production in America while allowing a theocratic Ayatollah. Understand, the Ayatollah chants with mobs, chants death to America and death to Israel. And Joe Biden has said, here's $100 billion. This seems like a great idea. And what happened with that $100 billion? Well, 90% of Hamas's funding comes from Iran. 90% of Hezbollah's funding comes from Iran. October 7th was in a very real way funded by money given by Joe Biden and the Democrats to Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah. And by the way, Biden also sent hundreds of millions of dollars into Gaza, even though many of us said, if you send it to Gaza, it will go to Hamas and be used for terrorism. They knew that. They agreed with that. The Biden administration concluded it was, quote, highly likely the money would go to Hamas for terrorism. You know what they did? They waived the anti-terrorism laws and said, send it anyway. Where are we now? Where we are now is the Biden administration is sending money right now to Gaza. Many of us said, if you send the money to Gaza, it will be seized by Hamas. What happened? The first shipment came in and boom, immediately seized by Hamas, exactly like we said. But they're combining it with blocking weapons to Israel. The Biden White House has been the most anti-Israel administration this nation has ever seen. Literally from day one, the Biden White House has been undermining Israel at every step of the way. When October 7th happened, when Hamas death squads were murdering 1,200 innocent civilians, were raping women and little girls, while the attacks were happening, the Biden State Department sent out a tweet at 3 in the morning saying Israel must not retaliate, there should be no military response. That tweet was disgraceful. I called it out at 3 in the morning, and they deleted the tweet within minutes. The next day, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, sent another tweet, said, I just talked with the Turkish foreign minister. We agreed Israel must not retaliate, must not strike back. I called that tweet out again. They deleted it again. Where are we today? Well, yesterday, Joe Biden said, quote, I made it clear if Israel goes into Rafah, I'm not supplying the weapons. We're not going to supply the weapons and the artillery shells. Now, I will point out Joe Biden and the Democrats lied to the American people on the supplemental funding bill that was just voted. They claimed it was to provide military funding to Israel. We now know they were lying. It was instead to give money to Gaza and Hamas, and everywhere else except Israel. We should have sent this military aid six months ago. 
Six months ago, many of us went to the Senate floor to force a vote on emergency military aid in November, right after October 7th. Every single Democrat voted no. It was a straight party line vote. A final observation. What Joe Biden is doing is not new. He has spent decades attacking and undermining Israel. Yes, it is true the radical left wing of the Democrat Party, the pro-Hamas wing of the Democrat Party is on the rise, is on campuses, and the Democrats are terrified of them. All of that is true. Yes, it is true they're terrified they're going to lose Michigan unless they give in to the pro-Hamas wing of the Democrat Party. But understand these sentiments are not new for Joe Biden. In 1982, when, by the way, I was 11 years old. Yeah, we're young. There you go, Ted. In 1982, <laughs> Joe Biden was a senator from Delaware, and he confronted Israel's Prime Minister Menachem Begin during his Senate Foreign Relations Committee testimony. And you know what Joe Biden was doing in 1982? Same damn thing he's doing in 2024. He threatened to cut off aid to Israel in 1982. And Prime Minister Begin responded as follows. Quote, don't threaten us with cutting off your aid. It will not work. I am not a Jew with trembling knees. I am a proud Jew with 3,700 years of civilized history. Nobody came to our aid when we were dying in the gas chambers and ovens. Nobody came to our aid when we were striving to create our country. We paid for it. We fought for it. We died for it. We will stand by our principles. We will defend them. And when necessary, we will die for them again, with or without your aid. Even though Joe Biden wants to abandon Israel, and even though the Democrats in the Senate and House apparently support him in wanting to abandon Israel, America does not, and we should not let him. We should stand together and say, America stands united with Israel, and Hamas should be utterly destroyed. Roger. All right. Amen. Damn, he's good. I want to pass the plate. He, he's, he is really good. Um, Senator Cruz, what that reminds me of is I keep calling Joe Biden's national security policy his schizophrenic national security policy. And you hit on a lot of the points. Uh, Senator Graham, I'm honored to stand in this foxhole with you. I've never been more honored to stand with these group of soldiers here fighting for the safety and well-being of Israel. You know, I've often said, don't watch, or I've often said, watch what Joe Biden and the Democrats do. Don't watch what they say, watch what they do. This is Senator Schumer, November 14th in the National Ball. I quote him, we will not rest until you get all the assistance you need. We will not rest until you get all the assistance you need. Several hours later, we had a vote where they tabled standalone funding for Israel. As a matter of fact, six times the Democrats have voted against standalone funding for Israel. I would ask Leader Schumer, where's his outrage today? If he sits here and says that he would not rest until Israel gets the help they need, where is, where is his outrage today? April 17th, Wall Street Journal, Joe Biden, and I quote him, now is not the time to abandon our friends. The House must pass urgent national security legislation for Ukraine and Israel. So April 14th, uh, the President of the United States is saying this is urgent. This week, as several people have referenced, on Holocaust Remembrance Day, Joe Biden said, never again. Never again to the Holocaust survivors and Jewish Americans. Here he is saying one thing, but he does another. His words are empty. This is why he has no respect on the world stage. He now holds aid up to Israel with zero transparency and zero communication to Congress. I want to just talk a second about Joe Biden's schizophrenic foreign policy. This is what makes him such, so, so very weak and, and why our enemies don't, don't fear us and our allies don't respect us anymore because he has a schizophrenic policy. He says he wants to help Israel, but he's bowing knee to a, to a handful of votes in Michigan. 
He can't thread this needle. He's putting political aspirations ahead of sound national security policy. That's why it seems schizophrenic to me and to many Americans as well. At the end of the day, we don't know where Joe Biden stands. I don't know where he stands on this issue. He says one thing, he does another. Does he stand with Israel or does he stand with Hamas? Does he stand with the anti-American protesters rioting across, rioting across American college campuses? All of his actions are saying that he stands with Hamas. Again, I'm honored to be up here today and I just want our friends in Israel to know, as for me and my family, we're standing with Israel. Thank you. There are only 49 of us, so there'll be an end to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, well welcome, to, welcome to Joe Biden's America. Tuesday morning, I left the beautiful Big Sky country in Montana and flew back to Washington, D.C. I landed at DCA. My staff picked me up, and we were on our way to see George Washington University. I walked on that campus. I stood in front of the statue of George Washington. The statue of the founder of our country was wrapped in a Palestinian flag. His head was wrapped in the keffiyeh, the black and white checkered scarf. Spray painted, vandalized the bottom in red spray paint, it said genocide. And then there was a whiteboard leaned up against the bottom of the statue. Now, keep in mind, this is ground zero of the pro-Hamas encampment. So as I'm looking at the statue of George Washington, I'm seeing tents, as far as you can see, with this pro-Hamas encampment. And on that whiteboard, it said, no Zionism. Later that day, and by the way, when I was on campus, I chatted with some of the Jewish students, one of the rabbis there, as they are afraid to even walk on their campus. Yet later that night, these pro-Hamas protesters went to the university administrators and the president's home and called for the beheading of some of the administrators and leaders at GW. I didn't think I'd live to see the day of this going on in our university campuses. Joe Biden did nothing. And then the lethal aid that Joe Biden said he wanted to provide Israel, it's now on hold. Why is that on hold? To appease his liberal base in places like Dearborn, Michigan, because Joe Biden's in trouble in Michigan. This is not going to help Israel win the war. It's not going to help to get our hostages home. Mr. President, Afghanistan was bad enough. Now you're going to leave more Americans stranded and in the hands of terrorists. Every single Democrat should be standing with us at this moment, condemning the president's remarks and pleading with him, demanding he reverse his course. The choice is very simple. There's a moment of moral clarity needed in American history at this moment, this hour. It's simply this. You are either for Israel or you're for Iran and their desire to exterminate Israel and Jews around the world. Uh, Ted, Bud, Katie, and me, and we'll take questions. Senator Graham, thanks for hosting this, for your leadership uh, on this issue and around the world. Um, I just returned from a congressional delegation trip, Senator Ernst, to the Middle East. And uh, while we were there, we met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, we discussed the situation about hostages and their military operations in Gaza. And after everything we heard, we know that President Biden's decision to withhold critical ammunition to Israel, it's a total betrayal of our friend and our ally. Israel's in an existential fight for survival against genocidal Hamas terrorists. And those same Hamas terrorists currently hold eight American citizens, including North Carolina native Keith Siegel. The best way that we can bring them home, it's by increasing pressure on Hamas. But by withholding lethal aid, President Biden is signaling to Hamas that it's okay to hold out and to continue their campaign of terror. So the bottom line is this. President Biden is making it harder to bring these hostages home. And the ultimate absurdity of this decision by President Biden in the, is that the administration is withholding precision-guided munitions. Senator Risch spoke about this earlier. 
because the Biden administration is actually making civilian casualties more likely. But at the end of the day, we know what all of this is about. For President Biden, this is about November elections. And I know firsthand that President Biden is overruling his own national security team, and he's letting a few radical activists on his staff dictate our foreign policy. He's just too weak to say no. President Biden is putting politics over our friends and allies, the Jewish people, and our friends, the American hostages. This is one of the most shameful displays that we've ever seen from a U.S. president. It telegraphs to the world that the U.S. is not to be trusted. We deserve better. Thank you. I want to start by thanking Senator Graham for your leadership on this um, and so many important issues. You know, as I stand here listening to all of my colleagues make such incredible points that somehow this administration continues to miss, I can't help but think they also continue to miss the opportunity to learn from history. As we heard Senator Daines talk about what's happening on our college campuses, talking about the lack of enforcement of Title VI, this administration refusing to protect our Jewish brothers and sisters as they want to go to class, they want to eat peacefully in dining halls, be okay in their dorms. I remember that discrimination upon race, denigrating someone upon race, blocking someone from a classroom wasn't okay in the 1960s. Do you hear me? And it is not okay today. This administration needs to stand up and stand against anti-Semitism. What else they're failing to learn from? I mean, yesterday we celebrated 79 years since VE Day, the victory there in Europe, liberating Europe from Nazi terror. Earlier this week, we honored those six million Jews that died in the Holocaust. We heard a place in this country, a Harvard-Harris poll just came out, where it said between the ages of 18 and 29, one in five of those individuals don't believe the Holocaust even existed. And on that note, I think it's important that we continue to tell the story of October 7th, because somehow that has gotten lost. Senator Graham led a delegation to Israel. We sat across from Israeli leaders. We watched the footage, the horrifying footage of those Hamas terrorists with the GoPro cameras strapped to their heads and their chest. When we talked to the Israeli officials, we mentioned 9-11. And they said, yes, it's similar, but I want you to understand why it's different. You were able to wake up on September 12th and tell your kids that the perpetrator was oceans away. We woke up on October 8th, and the people who want to eradicate this entire population are just miles down the road. I want you to think of what we're asking for parents in Israel who are tucking their children in at night. These disgusting, barbaric terrorists, they're not going after soldiers. They're coming after babies and beheading them. We watch them rape women. We watch them pull Holocaust survivors from their wheelchair. We watch them burn parents alive in front of their children. This is what we are up against. You cannot in good conscience ask parents to tuck their kids at night without believing that Israel can move forward and eradicate Hamas. There are still four battalions in Rafah. So understand what that means for the innocent people of Israel. We must do more. Never again is now. And I urge the President of the United States to not be the very first president to not stand with Israel. They are our greatest ally and they deserve us to stand shoulder to shoulder with them as they fight the evil that is Hamas. Well, well thank you all. So real, real quick, let's just build up where, Mr. President, reconsider this. It's okay to reconsider and change your mind when circumstance warrant. For over a year, I have been working with the Biden administration and many of my colleagues up here to try to have an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel that would end the Arab-Israeli conflict. On President Biden's watch, I believe a Democratic president is best positioned to build on the Abraham Accords when it comes to Saudi Arabia and Israel. That would be a major accomplishment. I think President Trump understands he would get his fair share of credit.
I have been to, to Saudi Arabia and Israel five times since the war. The goal is to try to bring Saudi and Israel to the table to conclude a deal that would end the Arab-Israeli conflict, isolate Iran, and find a better hopeful future for the Palestinians through direct negotiations with Israelis. I am still committed to that. Mr. President, if you do not change this policy, you will have destroyed the last best chance to deliver lasting stability in the Mideast for generations. Saudi Arabia is watching. Would you, as a nation, sign a defense agreement with the United States knowing what we have just done to Israel? Is signing on the dotted line with the United States in a mutual defense agreement equivalent to outsourcing your national security to the United States? That is the message you're sending. Israel's being asked to turn the war fighting over to the United States. Let us plan how to do this, not you. That is a huge mistake. Number one, I trust Israel more than I trust Austin. He still said Afghanistan withdrawal was a good idea. Bottom line, there's a lot at stake here. I think the region and the world is going to second guess future relationships with us, Mr. President, if you don't change your mind. Finally, is it right to give bombs to Israel in these circumstances? I think the answer is yes. I want to define the problem Israel faces. Hezbollah is a terrorist organization that has over 100,000 weapons pointed at Israel. They're Shiites. They're in Lebanon. They actively attack Israel regularly. Hamas is a terrorist organization that is dedicated to the destruction of the Jewish state, not helping the Palestinians. Their charter is not to bring about a better life for the Palestinians, but to destroy from the river to the sea all the Jews. And this is what they said after October the 7th. We're not ashamed to say this with full force. We must teach Israel a lesson, and we will do this again, again, and again. This is the spokesperson of Hamas after October 7th telling Israel, we're coming for you again, again, and again. Now, what is the proportional response to that? I want you to ask every Democrat and Republican, were you okay with using two nuclear bombs against Japan to end the war? Was that proportional? Were you okay with the firebombing of Dresden to break the backs of the Nazis? What is the right response to a group that rapes your women, puts your babies in an oven, and threatens to do it again? Drop bombs if you have to. So you got Hamas, you got Hezbollah, and the biggest Satan of all is Iran. In one week, Israel was attacked by Hezbollah, Hamas, and Iran. 300 rockets and missile, missiles launched from Iranian territory to the state of Israel. In one week. What is the proper response to three organizations dedicated to killing all the Jews if you're a Jew? What's the proper response 80 years after the Holocaust to make sure you don't have the second Holocaust. To fight. To fight with all your might. And here's what I want to say about the IDF. I've been there like all my colleagues. They're doing their best to restrict civilian casualties, I think. Here's the enemy. They're doing their best to make sure Israel kills as many Palestinians as possible. They have command headquarters under a hospital. I've been a military lawyer all my life. Hospitals are not legitimate targets unless you make them. They put weapons in mosques. They store weapons in schools. They fire rockets at Israel from apartment buildings. They're doing all they can to increase the cost of killing terrorists. For this very reason, the world will break. They could give a damn about the Palestinian people. They're religious Nazis on a quest to kill all the Jews. The last time somebody did this was Adolf Hitler. He wrote a book. Nobody believed him. President Biden, the enemies of Israel are dedicated to the destruction of Israel. 
withholding weapons makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to get American hostages back and Israeli hostages back because you're incentivizing bad behavior. Withholding weapons makes Iran stronger, not weaker. Withholding weapons in the most just war since World War II makes Saudi Arabia more doubtful. The consequences of this decision, Mr. President, are going to change the region and the world for all the worse. I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you, change course. Give Israel the weapons they need to finish this fight, and I'll tell you what Israel is going to do with Rafa. They will go in and destroy these battalions. How they do it is subject to negotiation. But what I fear is this decision to withhold weapons has made the likelihood of going in Rafa greater, not less. It's going to make it longer, not shorter. And the consequences of bringing real change to the Mideast are fading with every passing day. Mr. President, if you can summon the courage to say we're going to give Israel the weapons they need, I think we can get the Saudi-Israel deal back on track. I think you'll have all the critics up here behind you applauding. And what do we want? We want Israel to survive and thrive. We want Hamas destroyed. We want the Palestinians to have a better future. That only happens when you're unequivocal. Now's the time, Mr. President, to send a message to all the bad guys. We're with Israel. Now's the time, Mr. President, to reinforce all the rhetoric you've been saying for the last six months. On October the 7th, things change forever. This is Pearl Harbor and 9-11 for Israel. Our nation felt it was appropriate to drop nuclear bombs on two cities to end a war we could not afford to lose. I believe it's appropriate for Israel to have the weapons to destroy Hamas to make sure we never have to do this again. Here's what Bibi said, never again is now. Senator, is it your position that there is no red line when it comes to Israel's war with Hamas? My position is that Israel is fighting a just war. They're conducting themselves within the law of armed conflict, that Hamas is turning the law of armed conflict upside down, that the civilian casualties are mainly due in terms of numbers to Hamas's tactics, that I'm not going to second guess Israel. I'm going to give them the weapons they need. Israel's not the problem. What would we do? What did we do? We dropped two nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Should we have done that? Yeah, I think we should. We saved a million Americans from having to go and invade Japan. So no, Israel's tactics are not my problem. My problem is the equivocation by this administration to allow them to get on with doing this. So on the record, that's no? No. Yeah. Oh, so because I don't see a problem. If you want the hostages back, you've made it harder to get them back because there's daylight between uh, uh, the United States and Israel. Sinwar is feeling pretty good right now. The reason they're not dancing in Iran, they just don't dance. So here's the, na here's the implications immediately. The hostage deal becomes harder to do. The implications longer range is that the deal between Saudi and Arabia and Israel is less likely if Saudi Arabia believes we're going to take over and manage their national security by signing up with us. So I think the implications of Iran taking this as a sign of weakness uh, get stronger. I think the desire of Israel to destroy Hamas is, is, is non-negotiable and you're putting Israel in a bad spot. And then do you, do you also, given the developments that you brought up, um, Saudi-Israeli normalization, you still have a high confidence level? That's I, I am hoping it doesn't get derailed, but here's what you have to ask yourself. If you're Saudi Arabia, knowing what they're doing to Israel, would you sign on the dotted line? Knowing that they may come a day when you're in a fight for your life against maybe the Houthis or the Iranians, and all of a sudden we show up saying, no, you can't do this, you, you can't do that. All I can say, folks, if somebody had told us 
you're doing too much to destroy Germany and Japan after what they did, it would have fallen on deaf ears. Israel's trying to lower civilian casualties. Hamas is trying to increase civilian casualties. Therein lies their problem. Given that there have been no thousands of civilians that have died, yeah. do you think there should be no lever at all for the administration to try to prevent American weapons being used in attacks that even unintentionally end up killing innocent children? Or I think Israel is in a fight for its life that the reason so many Palestinians have been killed is because Hamas has command centers under hospitals. Hamas uses the Palestinian people as human shields. Don't reward their behavior. What you're doing is you're saying Hamas has put Palestinians in the crosshairs of, of Israel, so stand Israel down? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my friggin' life, is that you tell the person who's about to be wiped off the map, you got to slow down because your enemy is making it hard on the Palestinian people to survive because they choose to put them in harm's way. That is ass backwards. The, I'm going to add one thing, is that the, the blood of every person dying is on, is on Hamas's hands. And I think to Lindsay's point is that Israel has done everything they can to minimize uh, collateral damage in, and, and civilians dying. Even recently, you know, trying to get people out of uh, Rafah and moving them to out of harm's way as well. But what type of a soldier or warrior hides behind women and children? Come out and fight. Um, and w one thing I also want to add, Lindsay, is Hamas and Iran just don't want death to Jews. They want death to Americans, yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. Right. I left that out. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and let me add a couple of things. There are a series of questions saying, like the opening question, should America draw a red line? The premises of all of these questions are wrong. Israel does not want to kill even a single civilian. Israel's objective is clear and unequivocal. It is to protect the nation of Israel, to protect the lives of Israelis. And it is to defeat Hamas, to kill terrorists who want to murder every Jew on the planet. All of the questions, doesn't the Biden administration need to step in and stop the Israelis? No. Their objective is to kill zero civilians and there is no military on the face of the earth that does more to protect civilians, to avoid civilian casualties than the Israeli military. They do things like if they're going to drop a bomb, if they have intelligence that Hamas terrorists are in a building, they're going to drop a bomb on the building, they will do something like send a dud bomb first that lands on the ceiling of the building, doesn't blow up. And they do that so that the civilians can get out. Israel sends texts and cell phone calls to the civilians saying we are going to attack here because Hamas is there. Get out. Leave. Save yourself. You know what Hamas does? Hamas says, stay. Or, we want you, the Palestinian civilians, to die. I authored a resolution in the Senate, bipartisan resolution the Senate adopted, 100 to nothing, condemning the use of human shields as a war crime, condemning Hamas's use of human shields. I also authored sanctions for anyone that engages in the use of human shields. You know how many Hamas terrorists Biden has sanctioned for using human shields? None. What is Biden doing? He's sanctioning Israel. The entire premise, and contrast that to what Hamas does. On October 7th, Hamas did not launch a military attack on Israeli soldiers. That would have been bad but it at least would have been something recognizable as war. Attacking soldiers of a nation falls within the contours of warfare. That was not October 7th. October 7th, Hamas death squads went into civilian areas of kibbutz, people who are farmers. They were looking for civilians, and they were killing them for one reason, because they were Jews going door to door to door. It's the worst mass murder of Jews in a single day since the Holocaust. They killed elderly people. They killed toddlers and infants. We've watched the videos. When you see terrorists playing soccer with the head 
of a Jew they just beheaded. When you look at how they sexually abuse, violently rape little girls, women, mutilate them. They are disgusting. You want to vomit when you see the videos. And we watch them because we have a responsibility. Why? Because they're knuckleheads who insist it didn't happen. And so we should be standing with Israel unequivocally. You asked, what are the national security implications of this? America is at a greater risk today than we have been at any point in modern times. We have a higher risk for a terrorist attack today than we have at any point since September 11th. You combine that with the Democrats' open border, 11 million illegal immigrants flooding into this country while Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah have called for global jihad. It is only a matter of time before we see mass murder here, just like played out in Israel, just like played out in Russia, just like played out in New York City on September 11th. All of the questions, don't we need to stop the Israelis from killing civilians? They are doing everything humanly possible to stop, prevent killing civilians. And I want to make one final point on this. The enemies of America are emboldened. Iran is emboldened, Hamas is emboldened, Hezbollah is emboldened. Communist China is emboldened, Russia is emboldened, Venezuela is emboldened, North Korea is emboldened. What are the national security consequences of this? Today, because of Joe Biden's weakness and appeasement, the odds of China invading Taiwan have risen markedly. Because she is looking at this saying, oh, this administration is so weak, they'll tell Taiwan, hey, we won't give you weapons either. Chinese go on and invade. I want to finally underscore a very important story that broke last week, weekend. It came from Politico. And it was a story that says the funding for the anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, anti-American protests occurring at universities across the country, much of the funding came from Joe Biden and the Democrats' biggest donors. And here's who Politico identified. Politico identified George Soros, the Rockefeller brothers, Bill and Melinda Gates, and the Pritzker family, which collectively have given millions and millions of dollars to Joe Biden and to Democrats. Just about every Democrat in the United States Senate has cashed tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, from those left-wing gazillionaires. I'll tell you a question every one of you ought to be asking every Democrat, including Joe Biden, are you going to give back the money? Are you going to give back the millions of dollars you took from the people funding these anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, anti-American protests. And if you're not, if you're going to keep cashing the checks from the people paying for the protesters that are threatening Jewish students, threatening their safety on campus, then you stand with what they're funding. It's a simple and basic choice. What is happening on campus is happening because the Democrat base wants it to happen. And what Joe Biden is doing is he's encouraging Hamas. Hamas saw that statement and celebrated, and you know what? If you're a Hamas terrorist, you know what you say? Keep fighting. Yeah. Keep fighting. You know what? We've now got Joe Biden coming to the rescue. He's going to cut off the Israelis' weapons. Let's keep fighting. We can kill more Israelis. Final question. What, no, no, I, I want to ask a final question. <laughs> I want to ask a final question. We got two more after okay. he asked himself the question. Why isn't there a single Democrat here? I want you to pause and ask. There are 51 Democrats in the United States Senate. Is there not one of them who's sitting there saying, wait, Congress just voted. They said they were voting to send billions of dollars of military aid to Israel. They lied. By the way, some of us said at the time, they're lying, they're not going to do this. They want to give money to Hamas, but they're not going to give it to Israel. Some of us said exactly that. But is there not one Democrat with the courage to stand up and say, Mr. President, this is wrong, and between Israel and Hamas, you should have the courage to know which side you stand on, you should stand with Israel. Thank you. Two more questions. 
violations of U.S. law regarding foreign assistance, such as the Lady Act. I, I think there's a yeah, th there's a report coming out. I think tomorrow about that analysis. I don't know if it's coming out tomorrow or not. So here's what I would say. Yeah, we have laws on the books. Uh, Israel is uh, a well-regulated military. They have a judge advocate who I actually know. They prosecute people uh, who violate the law of war, IDF members. So what I would say is let's listen to see what the State Department says. But back to your question. What red lines did we have in World War II? <laughs> Apparently none. What I'm trying to do is destroy Hamas with the least amount of damage to the future. They got to go. For the sake of the Palestinians, they have to go. For the future of Israel, they have to go. The tactics being employed to destroy them are incredibly difficult because their behavior is making it so hard. The bottom line is when your enemy takes the people they represent and use them as pawns, to drive up the casual rate to hope the world turns on you, you don't want to reinforce that model. And I'll end with one thought that Ted had. If Hamas surrendered tomorrow and turned the hostages loose, would Israel still kill Palestinians? No. They would end the war because the threat to them is over. Here's the question. If Israel withdrew tomorrow and stopped dropping bombs, would Hamas still try to kill them? Yes. That's what this is all about. Israel is not a genocidal nation. Israel has got six peace agreements with Arabs. Israel is entertaining trying to recognize Saudi Arabia, the keeper of the mosque in Medina and Mecca. They have a history of integrating themselves in the region. What history does Hamas have? Killing Palestinians who want to work with Israel, destroying the Israeli population, driving them into the sea. This is about as clear contest as I've ever seen in my entire life. This is not difficult for me to figure out what to do. Senator Graham, briefly on the southern border, the Biden administration has proposed tighter uh, asylum restrictions. I just want to get your reaction to those. Do you think those are a step in the right direction? I, I, I welcome anything that would, would lessen the flow, put a cap on parole. Yes, Senator. Biden took unilateral uh, yeah. action to yeah. consult with Congress. Is there anything Congress is considering to do to curtail the president's prerogative to... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, we're thinking about what, what tools do we have available. So to my Democratic colleagues, you could be in the same boat here. I mean, you know, there is checks and balances here. There are rules. There are rules, rules of war. And there should be. I've been a military lawyer. I'm not asking to abandon international law here. I'm just trying to get people to understand that the enemy here is using, uh, is abusing every law in the books, making it very difficult for Israel. And I don't want to reward that behavior by punishing the victim. You want to punish the offender, not the victim. So we're going to look at what tools do we have. And here's the first tool I have. Sit down with Democrats and see if we can walk this back. Senator, on the Yeah. I, I, I didn't come here to talk about that, but given what they did to Trump, I think you'd make a good argument. But I, I didn't come here to impeach the president. I came here to let everybody know we don't agree with this decision. I don't know where our Democrat friends are. It's a horribly bad decision and dangerous because it does put the hostages more at risk. It makes the world go on longer. It emboldens Iran at a time they need to be contained. And I think what it's going to do is take off the table the last best chance for structural changes in the Mideast. Uh, the ICC coming after Israel? Bad idea. I hope they stand down. Last question. How do you feel about progressive members uh, bringing GW protesters to the Capitol yesterday? You know, what's going on on college campuses is part, it disgusts me at times, but this is a free country. Bringing these protesters into the Capitol, I think, sends the wrong signal. But I don't think they're here to kill me. I don't think anybody in Israel wants to kill me or other Americans. I believe Hamas wants to kill us all. They want to purify Islam in, in their image. They want to destroy the Jewish state. And they want to kill Americans, the great Satan, Iran, Hamas, and Hezbollah want to kill. It's one thing.
to act out, to say outrageous things. That's different to me than going into a person's home, killing their kids in front of them, raping their wife, and going to the next house. I promise you, we're not going to let this happen again. We will be with you, Israel.